So what we hope to do with this particular session is to try to define the scope and contours of the phenomenon we're talking about here called outsourcing. And obviously that has a lot of different forms and a lot of different uh, wrinkles to it. And we're trying to get, we're going to attempt to give some shape to that. Um, and to help me do that, uh, we've assembled, as I said, the all-star team. So I hope all of you outside are understanding what you're missing uh, by not being here for this group. Um, so we have here Susan Hausman, who is a senior economist at the Upjohn Institute and a recognized expert on temporary help employment, outsourcing, and non-standard work arrangements. Uh, Susan has conducted research in a number of different areas, but most relevant for what we're talking about here, she's examined trends in employers' use of non-standard work arrangements and their implication for wages, benefits, and employment stability. She chairs the Technical Advisory Committee to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and as member of the editorial board of the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Before Upshon, she was at the University of Maryland uh, School of Public Affairs and a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution. And she received her PhD in economics from Harvard University, which is instantly intimidating to someone like me who never quite got their PhD mm -hmm. uh, from a much lesser institution. Uh, we also have Aneta Barnhart, who uh, is a visiting researcher at the UC Berkeley Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. That's a long title. We just think of it as the Berkeley Labor Center. Uh, and a visiting professor at the Berkeley Sociology Department, also a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. She is a much-loved former colleague yeah. of ours yeah. at yeah. NELP. Yeah. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that I understand she has a propensity to get sick right before every NELP conference, <laughs> I've been told. Uh, at NELP, she coordinated policy analysis and research support for campaigns around living wage jobs uh, and enforcement of workers' rights and accountable development. Uh, she's a leading scholar, scholar of low-wage work and one of the principal investigators of the study Broken Laws on Protected Workers, which many of you may have used or encountered, uh, having to do with uh, wage and hour overtime and other types of uh, violations in the low-wage labor market. Her most recent book has a very nice and colorful title, The Gloves Off Economy, which she has co-edited, uh, Workplace Standards at the Bottom of America's Labor Market. And then we also have Michael Grable, who covers economic and labor issues for ProPublica. Not Publica, right? Depends if you want to be correct. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> Do, <laughs> I would like to be correct. <laughs> no, I think the correct line is ProPublica. ProPublica. Like okay. Everyone in the newsroom says ProPublica. ProPublica, okay. It does sound a little bit affected to say ProPublica isn't okay. <laughs> Uh, where he recently wrote a series of stories investigating temp worker abuses. We're going to hear a little bit about this. Uh, Michael has produced stories for the New York Times, NPR, and Time Magazine. Uh, before ProPublica, Michael was a reporter at the Dallas Morning News, and he is the author of Money Well Spent, question mark, a book about President Obama's stimulus package and the efforts to revive the economy from the Great Recession. He also manages to keep that wonderful personality and uh, disposition despite researching some of the most egregious working conditions you'll ever hear about. And we will hear about them in a second. So this is the distinguished panel. Uh, before we uh, kick it off and have Susan talk some about her work and research, I wanted to just try to uh, put in context some of the work and the, the types of forms and structures we're going to be talking about. Uh, and my colleagues at NELP who have authored the report that you find in your packets have done some work to try to conceptualize the different structures here. It's not the only way you could conceptualize different ways you uh, you know, uh, outsource work, uh, you know, manifests itself. Uh, but I would like to just put up some slides so people um, can see how uh, we've been thinking about it at NELP, and hopefully it's instructive and will help shed light on some of um, what our panelists will be talking about. So uh, this figure sort of shows one, uh, we're sort of talking about three different um, groupings here. The first grouping here would uh, be uh, sort of as you see it, basically firm to worker engagement. Uh, so you have lead companies and they either make their workers function as independent contractors, as franchisees, now separate here from the fast food context where franchisees are actually a company and then another, we'll see that in a second, work underneath that, uh, or a lead company where they require their workers to essentially function as limited liability corporations. Uh, in my head, at least, the quintessential model for this and I think about, or the quintessential arrangement that we're all familiar with is FedEx, in my head. Uh, there are other examples, of course, but this is one grouping. 
Um, a second grouping would look like this, where you've got a lead company and then a labor-only staffing firm or a temp firm or a labor contractor. And that's obviously a broad group of types of uh, different structure. But the difference between uh, grouping one and this grouping would be the insertion of an intermediary between uh, the lead company and the workers. Uh, whereas the first grouping, the workers are not employed directly by uh, the lead company here, uh, but there is no intermediary. So now we're inserting one layer of, uh, of intermediariness, to use a very technical term. Um, and uh, again, those, that layer could look very different depending on whether it's a staffing firm or a, or a long-term contractor, but it does add this layer. And then we can look in a sort of third grouping where you have a lead company and a bunch of different layers between the lead company and uh, the workers who are actually performing the work necessary for that company to sell its products or deliver its products, et cetera. Uh, here I think about, uh, as shorthand, uh, a garment company which uh, may retail at the top uh, and, and sell garments. They may have uh, you know, a manufacturer of those garments in a domestically or abroad. That manufacturer may, in turn, subcontract further to a staffing firm, uh, a temporary staffing firm, or other sort of subcontractor that actually is providing the workers um, who are doing the work. So we essentially now have multiple layers in between. So these three groupings aren't, uh, there's some overlap to these, obviously. They're not perfectly clean, um, uh, but hopefully as sort of uh, concepts that help, help us think about the different types of arrangements uh, we're going to have our panelists talk about. So I'm going to kick it now to Susan. <coughs> and we're going to need PowerPoint 2. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I will, I, I'll start off anyway. Um, that's coming up somewhere. Just uh, while we're waiting for that, I, I spend a lot of my time as a researcher kind of looking at uh, data issues and I think um, and measurement issues. And I kind of went into that in part because uh, lots of stuff that we don't want to, that we really want to know about just isn't measured. It isn't available in statistics. And this whole issue of contracting out uh, was one thing that really got me into that area. But several years ago, I spent, uh, I wrote a paper with a couple of uh, uh, labor economists at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, Ann Polifka and Matthew Day, uh, called What Do We Know About Contracting Out in the United States? You know, we did this research over the course of a couple of years. We were looking at government statistics, official statistics. And after many pages and years of research, our bottom line conclusion was unfortunately very little. And it's not hard, if you step back and think about it, why that's the case. The Bureau of Labor Statistics in its household surveys, for example, goes out uh, in the CPS that we all know about, goes out and asks people, um, uh, you know, what's your occupation and where do you work? Who pays you, basically? Who's your employer? And similarly, in establishment surveys, they go to establishments and say, how many workers do you have and what's your industry? But in the case of contracting, we, the, the people that the uh, contractor, that the lead firm, the client firm is hiring are not their employers. And the whole premise of the way we set up our statistical system with household surveys and establishment surveys assume that the people who are hired by a company are doing the work for that company. Um, it is true that the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis takes data uh, to a large degree from the Bureau of Census, uh, from BLS, and lots of other sources, and builds what we call input-output uh, tables for the, that sort of model the whole economy. So in principle, these should capture all the contractual relationships in the economy. And indeed, these are used to estimate labor inputs from one industry into another um, by many people. Uh, and the I.O. tables have shown a significant increase in domestic contracting out. Uh, through in recent years, but the underlying data are very, very spotty and the imputations are quite crude. So they're not a very reliable source when you get, you know, into any kind of detail about what's really going on in the economy. The contingent worker supplements to the CPS that many of you are probably familiar with 
uh, were administered five times from 1995 to 2005, and they were really designed to fill in the, uh, the gaps in our knowledge um, about contract relations and other contingent workers. Um, this shows, uh, this graph uh, shows an average over these five surveys. There wasn't much trend in the data uh, in terms of three con what I would call contract relationships. Uh, independent contractors, um, oh, sorry, I skipped. Let me, let me step back here. It surveyed three types of contractual relations. Independent contractors, those are people who identify themselves as independent contractors, independent consultants or freelance workers, temporary uh, agency workers. And then in contrast to other surveys, they actually said, where do you work? Who's your client? What organization do you actually perform the work at? And then they asked about if individuals were contract company workers. These are workers that were employed by a particular company that in turn provides services, uh, their services to another organization. They're usually, the BLS was really after individuals who are primarily assigned to one company. Um, and it collected information, again, on who are you working for, what's the client uh, company industry. And as you can see from these data, um, far and away the biggest in their survey was independent contractors at between 6 and 7 percent of uh, aggregate employment. Lots of people identify themselves as independent contractors. Contract company workers, on the other hand, came in slightly over 1% and agency temps at about 1%, a little under 1%. Now, some people were surprised by these numbers. They kind of thought that contract company workers in particular should be bigger. You know, that was people's perceptions and there wasn't any trend increase. And indeed, in the case of agency temps, we can compare it to other surveys and it does look like it's under underrepresented. So there is reason to believe that perhaps in general, the survey underrepresented these workers. That perhaps wouldn't be surprising. People are confused. You call up a house and you might be confused about the terminology they're using, um, or your kid might be answering the survey and <laughs> knows what they say. But in any event, um, uh, this is what we've got. I, I would sort of like po want to point out that even if we think uh, that uh, if we add up these, these various categories, they're really not small. Even if we focus on contract company or agency temps, two to three or more percent of the workforce really is not that small. I mean, it's still quite a significant portion. I'm going to, in the rest of my, or my few minutes remaining, focus on temporary help. Annette will talk more about the contract company work and independent contractor uh, dimension of contract work, um, in part because it's the best measured, although it's still most studied of all the contract employment types, although there's still big gaps in our information here. Um, and in part because it's experienced really rapid growth in recent years. We might think that some of the same forces that are driving the growth in temporary help are causing growth in other types of employment arrangements. And so in some sense, it might be the tip of the iceberg of, of what's going on. This shows uh, temporary help employment as a percent of total payroll employment in the economy between 1989 and 2014. There was a huge increase a doubling from roughly 1% to 2% between 1989 and 1999, just in a decade. Um, huge increase in temporary help employment. That was largely driven by manufacturers um, who were using uh, uh, staffing services in, a, in an important way for the first time as part of their you know, permanent uh, staffing strategy. You can see that with uh, after in the last two recessions, temporary help became extremely cyclical. It flattened out in the early 2000s. Um, I would argue in large part because, again, much of the growth that had been driving it was from manufacturers, and we all know what happened to manufacturing in the early 2000s. Um, what we're seeing at the tail end is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, temporary help really it took a heavy hit in the Great Recession, but it's come back in a big way and is at a level of employment and as a percent of employment never seen before. This is just, uh, I won't dwell on this, but this graph illustrates that perhaps even more strongly. It is the change in employment since the, in, in the aggregate economy overall and in temporary help 
relative to the last cyclical peak, which is in December of 2000. You can see again temporary help uh, employment in that sector dropped by over 30 percent. But look how it's come back much more strongly than in the aggregate economy. So briefly, we might want to think about why uh, employers use temporary help workers. Um, you know, there are many, many reasons, but some of the major ones are to meet short-term staffing or project-based needs. You can more easily, it's argued, flex up and flex down your workforce levels. Uh, with temps, more closely match workforce to workforce needs. It's sometimes been dubbed the just-in-time workforce strategy. Employers can save on labor costs, and that's not just perhaps because they're saving on hourly wage or benefits costs, but also because they're only hiring workers when they need them. Okay. They, uh, an imp another important reason is screen workers for per uh, permanent positions. And I, last thing that I wanted to mention uh, is potential use. Uh, many people think, many industry analysts think, that the employer mandate in the Affordable Care Act will boost employer <laughs> demand for agency staffing because for all intents and purposes, temporary help agencies are um, uh, not subject to the employer mandate. Briefly, uh, occupational distribution, if you think about the early years of the temporary staffing, uh, it was uh, largely in clerical, think Kelly girls, in the early, uh, in the 1980s and then into the 1990s, moved into production and more manual occupations such that now they account for uh, about half or a little over half of employment in temporary staffing. Um, one thing to pay attention to is professional technical workers. They've been growing a lot. And the industry um, itself sees this as a major source of growth in the future. Um, I'd also mention that low wage and minority workers are overrepresented. Am I out of town? Oh, yeah, OK, good. Um, might think about step back and think about how temporary are temporary jobs really? And we hear a lot about um, uh, perm attempts. Um, you won't find this in official statistics, in any government statistics, but I'm, uh, uh, Carolyn Heinrich and I uh, at the University of Texas are working with a, a data set from one of the largest, world's largest temporary staffing firms um, in which we can look at, at the duration of assignments. And across all occupations, it's kind of true, they're short-lived. Median uh, duration of an assignment is just three weeks. Um, however, this reflects the fact that lots of people don't last on temp jobs. You know, there's a very large number that are in and out in one day because they quit. They, they, they don't complete the assignment successfully. Some don't make it to the first uh, uh, coffee break. <laughs> but an important point to, to note is, is that most work occurs in assignments that are quite long. Across all occupations, half of all billed hours in this particular firm, which we think is reasonably representative of, of temporary staffing, half of all hours are worked in assignments lasting six or more months. A quarter of all hours are in assignments lasting one year or more. Uh, in production, it's still quite large. Uh, quite high. Half of all work is in assignments lasting five or more months. Of course, in science, engineering, IT, these professional technical occupations, half of all work is in assignments lasting 10 or more months. It's very common in these professional technical jobs in our data that we've seen for them to be uh, in assignments one to two years or more. Um, I'm going to close with just a quick couple of notes on what are the implications for workers. And here I'm just, just you know, very briefly touching, uh, kind of asserting some stylized facts that the re has come out in the research. Um, it is the case that uh, studies in the United States, as well as studies in Europe, find that hourly wages uh, are not necessarily lower um, in temporary help than in regular direct hire jobs. That is, if you take an individual, go out, and you sort of are comparing apple to apples to apples, what sort of job would they find on their own in direct hire job versus a temporary help, the hourly wages aren't that low. But of course, there are instances where they are lower. But we find that the um, quarterly earnings, so earnings over any period of time, are in fact a quite a lot lower. And that's reflecting the fact that the work is sporadic. 
it's not stable. And that, I think that's a really important point. Um, also, of course, temporary help workers rarely earn, um, receive uh, health insurance, retirement, or other benefits. And then, in closing, um, you know, if temporary help jobs aren't, by almost everyone's standard, great jobs, um, that, and it is the fact that most individuals in these jobs are doing them with the goal of, of getting a, a permanent direct hire employment. So they're using them kind of as a stepping stone. This um, question, whether temporary help jobs are stepping stones to better work, has been uh, greatly researched both in the United States and in Europe where there's high levels of temporary help employment. It's also the case that government um, return to work programs such as WIA or Welfare to Work extensively use, place their clients in temporary help jobs. And that, you know, understandably is somewhat controversial. Um, it's done because they see it as a way to build contacts, careers, experience, and so forth. But the research evidence suggests it's not a very good stepping stone. The best research, in my view, suggests it's not a good stepping stone. It does not help workers to move to a more stable employment. And uh, other strategies uh, would, workers in these sorts of programs would be better served by placing them in, in regular jobs. Thank you. PowerPoint three. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, Lord, good afternoon, everyone. So I uh, obviously have laryngitis, which I have had on almost all NELP conferences and retreats. Oh my God, this is going to be tough. All right, so I'm going to do my best, but bear with me. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about domestic contracting out. Um, and I will define in a minute what that is because this area is all about definitions, but um, I will be ending in a place very similar uh, to Susan, which is the data are crappy. We don't know a lot about it. But what I would say is there's a great new NELP report that you have in your packet. Take it home, read it tonight, cuddle up with it. It's awesome. David Weil just wrote a great book, The Fissured Workplace. Take it home, read it, cuddle up with it. All of the groups here have done amazing research over the last several decades documenting these new externalized employment relationships in their industries. You know, again, find that research, uh, immerse yourself in it. The reason I flag this is because I think sometimes we feel like we're saying, oh, we don't measure anything, we don't know anything, we can't get our arms around it. But in fact, we know so much on the ground from the organizing campaigns, from the community-based research we've done. And I don't think we need to wait um, until, can you go back, sorry, uh, oh, oh, me, oops. All right, well, anyway, it's there. Um, we don't need to. We have to be pushing for better data, better research, but we don't need to wait. We know so much already. We know enough to figure out strategic campaigns. We know enough to figure out what are the legal fixes that are needed, um, what are the legislative changes that are needed. So I just say that before I get, get totally depressing about the fact that we have no data. But before I do, someday you should go uh, hit Google, type in subcontracting supply chains, and you will get, and then click images, you will get pages and pages of junk that looks like this. Um, and if you, at all, if you are at all sort of visually sensitive, I do not um, suggest doing this because this is sort of a nightmare of epic fails in PowerPoint, the stuff that people are putting up here. But um, this is a, these are just some examples of how people have mapped out or tried to draw um, different types of supply chains, contracting relationships, and so on. And besides it being fun to look at, I put it up because um, this is one case, unlike some other um, uh, employer tactics like wage theft, this stuff is very much in the open. You know, a lot of the push for contracting out, the push to networked employment has come from business schools, from management consultants, from industry trade groups, from, from private equity folks, right? It's very much in the open. There are people who really believe that this is great for the economy, and in some industries it is. Um, there, uh, and it has really been gospel. So I'm just saying, flagging that, that is, um, that's sort of the arena we're playing in. This is a very conscious um, and, in many cases, heralded change in how employers produce 
Okay. So what do I need? Hello? There we go. So what do I mean by contracting out? Um, so in this, for this, I'm talking about the permanent contracting out uh, for the productions of goods and services by firms. Um, and note um, the emphasis on, on permanent. Um, in the research literature, people use a term, you know, in the past, uh, companies were vertically integrated. They produced everything in-house. Now we've moved to network production. Um, and firms are increasingly contracting with other firms for goods and services, not just temporarily, and I'm not talking about intermediaries. These are two firms who have a contract um, to provide, uh, uh, with some level of permanence, goods and services. Um, and that's a central part of their business strategy. It's not to adjust to changes in the business cycle or um, to uh, temporary lulls in demand. This is sort of a long-term strategy. Now. Um, as a result, people often distinguish this from the use of temp workers or other shorter-term staffing uh, arrangements. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of smooshing and blurring here of the lines. Uh, like Susan said, there's a lot of longer-term temp workers. But it is surprising if you look at, um, and those of you who are union researchers know this in your industries, if you look at the, the world of people who talk about this stuff, they really do distinguish from the sort of much more permanent um, outsourcing, subcontracting, et cetera, uh, from just sort of temporary, you know, staffing on, staffing up. Um, and then the other interesting thing what surprised me is that many researchers in, the, in this universe think of independent contractors as being part of this world. They just think of independent contractors as very, very, very small contract firms, you know, an N of one or two. Um, and it came as a surprise to me because I've been working mainly with low-wage worker and low-wage low worker organizations. But of course, the bucket of independent contractors includes things like architects and lawyers who are on their own. Um, and so uh, they are seen in this world as a firm that contracts for and, to pro and provides goods and services to another firm. Sort of a nice, uh, sort of an interesting head twister. I should say they're talking about independent contractors that are not misclassified, you know, true independent contractors. So some folks do include them in this bucket. All right. So, oh my God. Um, uh, as the NELP report makes clear, there's tons of different forms of this, and I'm not going to try to even do like a, um, any type of rigorous uh, sort of um, a crystallization of the different tendencies, but we have traditional supply chains like in manufacturing. We have contracts that are mediated by third-party contractors uh, in the logistics industry. It's totally fascinating. Those of you who work with warehouse workers know this. There are now these new contractor firms, and their job is to coordinate the contracts um, of other firms. And in fact, there's now even fourth-party logistics providers who, whose job is to coordinate the work of the third-party logistics providers. You get the idea. <laughs> totally wild west of contracting. There's project-based uh, contracting that's been around for a long time in the construction and film industry. There's a spoke model. Um, some firms uh, contract out for lots of different things. They're sort of surrounded by little baby contractors, like accounting, IT, janitorial services. But I also urge you to think about the contractors themselves as firms. And uh, uh, for example, Cintas, an industrial laundry firm, it has a lot of clients around it and may even be contracting out uh, on, on short-term basis for, for other services. So um, I think the upshot, and then uh, we have network production in the, in the uh, video gaming industry, really interesting, looks totally different from anything we see in the industries we know. It really is true network production. There's not a lead firm. Um, games are programmed and put on market by an entire constellation of little programming shops. Anyway. I, I'm, I'm babbling on about this partly to get, give you a sense that um, uh, there's a huge variation in contracting arrangements here. I think they probably map onto whether or not the outcomes for workers are bad or not. And this stuff is changing so rapidly, it's completely nuts, which I think goes back to what you're saying. It is changing by the day, especially in some of the new industries. All right, so uh, here's a quick montage of all the crazy things that are being contracted these days, um, uh, again, permanently contracted out for uh, basically anything that a firm does, 
some firm in the U.S. is contracting out for, for it. And I won't read all the examples up there, but, you know, a lot of it is the low-edge stuff that you and I know, the building services work, the housekeeping, et cetera. But hospitals are starting to contract out diagnostic labs, um, contract out for R&D, for high-end design, cable installation, all logistic stuff, aircraft maintenance. I mean, you name it. This is just a sampling of what is being contracted out. It's, it's you know, if it weren't so horrible for the workers, it would be sort of interesting. Um, so then how common is, is contracting out? So one, we really don't know. Um, we have some data from firms, and Susan intimated this. Uh, depending on the firm survey, this is very funny, anywhere from 35 to 93 percent of firms contract out. Very funny, very precise estimate. Uh, uh, there's probably an updated number, but as much as 12 percent of GDP at, currently in the U.S. Um, is coming from domestic providers of contracted services. And then it definitely seems like contracting out, the permanent contracting out, has really increased over time. And Susan had some numbers from uh, from the from the NIPA accounts on that. Um, in terms of the jobs that are contracted out or workers that are contracted out, here's where we do not have a comprehensive national estimate. Um, and this is where I think a lot of work needs to be done. Um, as a very baseline number, we know there's 18.6 million workers who are working in what is known as professional and business services. It's a huge new industry that's growing very fast. It has high-end professional jobs, like the accountants I mentioned, who are contract workers, um, and low-end jobs like the janitors and the security guards. But that's just a very bottom baseline. I think there's a lot more contract workers hiding in different parts of our occupational and industry codes, and that is one of the things that um, a lot of us are trying to work on. Here's just a sample. Um, uh, for some occupations, you can calculate what percent are contracted out, and I don't know if you guys can see the numbers. This is ranging both from low-wage occupations all the way to high-wage occupations. Um, these are huge percents contracted out, uh, right, 20, 30, 50, up to 82 percent, uh, meaning of the workers in those occupations, the percent that are working for a contract company rather than an original company. In my mind, this is where the action is. I mean, I think, you know, temp work is important, especially, obviously, in, manu in manufacturing. Um, On-call temps are important, et cetera, but those are relatively small percents of the workforce. This is where I think um, we're seeing a lot of the, the fingerprint of this new form of contracting out. Again, we don't have enough data on it, but I think that's um, where a lot of the action is. And then in terms of impact, uh, it won't come as a surprise for a good number of workers, not all, but for a lot of workers, uh, the impact is obviously low wages. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to read all of these, but this is from existing studies of the, of the few times we're able to study the impact. You can see significant wage penalties when somebody's working for a contractor, higher rates of wage theft, higher rates of misclassification, especially occupational health and safety, um, much higher rates of injuries, deaths, et cetera, total lack of training, OSHA training. Um, so that is definitely um, uh, one model. What I would say and beg of you guys, though, is I don't think this is a simple uniform story. And I think the story of contracting, domestic contracting out, um, is more complex. So here are a couple of quick closing thoughts um, on some of the themes that we see emerge. And this is part of the research that NELP has been doing, looking at existing research on contracting out. And I have to tell you, after reading over gazillions and gazillions of studies, um, uh, my conclusion, at least, I don't want to talk for NELP, but from that project was that contracted work is not inherently contingent and the impact on job quality is not inherently negative. There are segments of contracting out where uh, the jobs are full-time, they're stable, and they're well-paid. Um, and so there's a wide range of outcomes here. Um, everything from the fissuring exploitation that David Weil so well has documented uh, in janitorial and fast food, but also to the full-time permanent jobs of professional services. Um, and I think unpacking this 
when is contracting out a really bad thing? Um, that's something we really have to get our hands around because I don't think we get anywhere saying, you know, trying to pass legislation to just stop all contracting out, right? The horse has left that barn a long time ago. Um, how do we figure out um, how to identify where the bad models are because that will help us shut them down. Okay, uh, very quickly, contracting out is not unidirectional or static. And new functions like waste management were never in-house to begin with. This is another important thing. Uh, increasingly, a lot of new functions are starting out uh, being contracted out. They were never in-house to begin with. And I think as we go forward, we will see more and more of that. I think right now we've got this model. Jobs used to be in-house. They're being pushed out-house. But I think as we go forward, it's increasingly, um, you know, everything starts out-house. And then what is our model about legal accountability? And then finally... And this is something I'm obsessing about. Increasingly, there's a, the trend is consolidation in contractor industries. And the folks here from food services will know this story that Compass, Sodexo, and Aramark, which are the three big food services companies, now completely dominate, um, completely dominate their, uh, their sector. And they're increasingly doing much more than providing food services. So here is the website of Sodexo. And if you can see it, they're not just providing food services anymore. They are ba basically providing wraparound, one-stop shopping services to their corporate clients, including, uh, you'll see they have uh, now doing justice services, which is a euphemism for basically running prisons. Uh, they're getting into home health care. They're getting into education. They're getting into defense, right? This is, uh, this is not the type of contractor that I think a lot of us have in our mind as a small mom and pop who has no control over prices or wages. Um, this is a new world. Um, here's Securitas, which is the big uh, contract company providing security services. Look it up on the right. Those are all the countries where Securitas has clients. Right, so these are now multinational corporations. They have significant density in their markets. And I think this is something, not that all contractors are there already, but I think this is something we need to keep our eye on, especially when we're thinking about organizing strategies and policy strategies, that right now we may be dealing with a lot of smaller contractors, depending what industry you're in. I think it's inevitable, this is the nature of capitalism, right, that you see consolidation and concentration, and you're already starting to see it in some of these industries. Okay, so very quickly, research agenda for contracting out. This is so exciting, oh my God. Um, contracting out is easily the worst measured of the various dimensions of economic restructuring, so we urgently need to start tracking it systematically. Um, this is more on the geek front, but I think there's a lot of room for collaboration between the various statistical agencies, uh, and, I, and I'm sure David will be really interested in this. Um, but at the same time, as we're fighting to get national data, I think, and this is really relevant to the community groups and the unions in the room, we absolutely have to generate more in-depth, rigorous case studies in particular industries um, or production networks about what contracting out looks like. We have to map, you know, who's contracting with whom. We especially have to map who has the power. And that is changing very quickly in these supply chains and production work networks, which employers are the ones that drive standards. And I will give you an example uh, very briefly. I was just talking with somebody who knows uh, uh, international garment production really well. And he was saying that actually these days, it's the brokers and the middlemen, not the retailers anymore, who drive prices in garment production. Five years ago, we were all saying, you know, retailers totally run the show here. And in just five years, all of a sudden, there's a new actor here, which are middlemen companies, which are often not from the U.S., who are negotiating the contracts, who are setting prices and therefore impacting wages, right? So to me... This question, where does the economic power lie, is so critical, and it's not going to be an obvious one, and it's now not always going to be the main employer. And then finally, we have to measure the impact on the employment relationship and job quality. That's, of course, the whole reason why we're doing this. And then the third and final point is equally important will be to conduct uh, research on the contractor industries themselves, that increasingly they are the main employers, um, and we have to focus on them as much as the Walmarts, for example, who are doing the contracting out. All right, that's all I got. <laughs> that's all my voice has. So thanks so much.
think Annette gets A plus for commitment. So. <laughs> so how do I bring this up? Uh, next PowerPoint. I think it's four. So, uh, so while he's bringing that up, uh, I want to say something that he left out, uh, you left on my bio, is that I have a, I'm the esteemed recipient of a bachelor's degree <laughs> in English literature. <laughs> um, so I say that as a way of saying um, that I'm honored to be on a panel with uh, Annette and Susan, and when I was doing my initial research and saying, you know, I want to do something on subcontracting and temp work, uh, you know, their work is some of the stuff that I started reading. I, you know, I read The Glass Off Economy, and then I read a lot of Susan's academic work to, um, to sort of ground myself and see sort of what's, what's out there and where to go. Um, so I've been brought in to talk a bit about, uh, to, give, to talk about people at the end of the data section. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about data, but mostly people. So this is from the series that we did at ProPublica called, called Templand working in the new economy. Okay, so I want to take you to Little Village, Chicago. It's 4 a.m., it's pitch dark, except for uh, the neon lights on the storefronts. And the only activity you'll see are the tamale vendors who are beginning to set up shop. Uh, their, ste you know, their, their, their food trucks uh, steaming against the cold. Uh, and then out of the shadows, dozens of workers come streaming, lining up in an alleyway behind a dentist clinic uh, and a shop selling quinceanera dresses. Uh, they're bundled up. Um, this uh, year round, it could be January, it could be the summer. Um, some clutching their lunches or an atole from one of these, uh, from one of the tamale vendors. And they go behind the dentist clinic and they board uh, a yellow school bus. And you can see kind of the tail of the school bus at the end of that picture. These workers uh, know nothing about where they're going to work, except that it's called Los Peluches, which is Spanish for the stuffed animals, and that a guy named Rigo has told them that if they show up at, in the morning at 4 a.m., uh, there will be work. Um, so these people are actually temp workers for some of the nation's largest companies, and they, they, none of them can tell you where they work, you know, the place where they work, and none of them really even knew what temp agency has, because they never had contact with the temp agency. The only person who uh, they know in the system is Rigo. Um, uh, Rigo is what's known as a raitero. In Little Village, the um, people who give rides are kind of serve as labor brokers, working kind of indirectly for the, the temp agencies. Uh, and they do more, though, than just give rides. They, um, uh, they'll advertise the jobs in, in laundromats and in the check cashing places around uh, the neighborhood. And you'll go and you'll have to pay $5 for them to uh, fill out an application for you online or to give you an application. Um, you have to pay f about eight, $8 a day for the ride, uh, which in many cases is paying for the job because if you don't, if you say I have a car, uh, they'll tell you, uh, okay, go ahead and work it out with the temp agency if you want, but uh, then you won't have a spot on, on my van or my bus. And what usually happens is that space gets filled by somebody else. Um, another big factor here is, so that's what comes next, okay. Another big factor here is, is the waiting. So they arrive here at four o'clock for a bus that leaves around, um, they arrive between 4 and 4.30 for a bus that leaves around 5 um, to go uh, about 30 minutes, 30, 40 f minutes into the suburbs. And after talking to these workers, I was uh, with some uh, organizers for Chicago Workers Collaborative, and we followed the bus uh, down to the southwest suburbs of Chicago. And um, again, when we got to the place, it was an empty warehouse with uh, no sign of who was the employer, who was the warehouse, uh, totally anonymous. Uh, and so one of the workers said, you know, why don't you come inside? And, uh, and left a, a door open for us. Uh, so we walked in to the area. And again, there was like nothing here that tells you who they work for, except in this factory there is a, a clock uh, and some of the, a couple of signs that say select staffing. Uh, select staffing doesn't own this building, but they're the ones operating here. 
And if you notice, you know, they, they, you know, it took me a little bit of time to get inside. Uh, it was about 5.30, 5.35 by the time we arrived. The clock here says 5.42, and the sign in Spanish says, don't clock in until 5.55 or you will be punished. Um, so after the workers have come inside and hung up their jackets, they go and they wait in the cafeteria until 5.55, and they come back out, and they punch in, and then they go to work at, at 6 a.m. Um, at the end of the week, oh, oh I, I shouldn't have shown you that yet. Um, so who is this company they work at? No, you know, no one will tell us. Um, the security, the, the very nice security guard who looked like Jean-Claude Van Damme and said, get the hell out, um, uh, wouldn't tell us. Uh, and eventually, you know, sort of property records, we found out uh, that this is a company, Thai Incorporated. Does anyone know what Thai Incorporated is? Beanie Babies one of the largest stuffed animal manufacturers in the world, uh, whose owner pleaded guilty to tax evasion recently and had to pay $53 million in civil penalties, and the government is appealing about whether or not he should serve prison time. Um, so at the end of this chain, though, the workers don't receive their paychecks from Thai Incorporated. No one hands it to them at the factory. Nobody, they don't go to the temp agency and pick up their paycheck. It doesn't get mailed to them. Uh, Rigo, or the right data, will pick up the check at the end of the week and bring it to a check cashing place in Little Village where they will go and pick up their paychecks and often have to essentially have to pay for their paychecks. They're paying the check cashing fee, but if they don't want to pay the check cashing fee and they have a bank and they want to get it that way, uh, it takes several days. Or it's a big hassle. They get yelled at by the check cashing place uh, and they threaten their position, at, they threaten their spot on the bus for the work. So this is sort of one way that temp work exists. A much more common way, I want to introduce you to Rosa Ramirez. Rosa has worked as a temp worker for 12 years. She has, I want to read you some of the work she has done. She has packed free samples for Walmart, put together displays for Sony, printed ads for Marlboro, made air filters for the Navy, and box textbooks for elite colleges and universities. None of that work has led to a full-time job. Um, Rosa uh, came over here from, from Rosa is, um, came over here from Mexico and uh, to, you know, started out in Coleman, Alabama working in poultry plants and eventually moved to Chicago to give her kids a better life. Uh, except in Chicago, she's only been able to find temp work. Uh, and and uh, like, uh, uh, I think Annette said it that the the, uh, the pay, even though it might be minimum wage, is is sort of uh, sporadic. The, the the work is actually sporadic, so it, it comes out to something you know very seven thousand, ten thousand dollars a year at most. Um, this is Rosa is is very representative of the of temp workers in the U.S. Uh, we looked at some wage and hour data and found that eight hundred and forty thousand temp workers work blue-collar jobs making less than 25000 a year. Um, uh, so this is Rosa's room. She rents a room, uh, she rents the living room of a boarding house. Uh, that's essentially all, that, you know, we're standing in the doorway here. That is essentially all of, she, all that she has. Sorry, I keep trying to read through this. Uh, so there's, you see the mattress that's sitting on the floor. There's a sheet that blocks the French doors that separate her room from the hallway. And she shares a kitchen and a bathroom with another family. And a trap by her door guards against the rats that have woken, up, woken her up at night. Um, Rosa uh, kind of represents a different model of temp work where, which is more common, which is sort of the labor hall model. Temp workers come at you know 4:30 in the morning again, and they sit in the labor hall waiting for an assignment. Uh, and it could be that they have had that assignment and they go there every single day for six months. But uh, this is they, they are still kind of required to report to the labor hall. Um, when they go, uh, they get put on uh, vans, these 15 passenger vans, and uh, they'll often uh, you know just to, to save money. The, they'll, they'll try to pack people in to get to work. So people will squat on milk crates, it's very common. They'll uh, sit on the 
women will sit on the laps of men they don't know. Uh, or sometimes I've heard stories of workers lying on the floor in the space between the, uh, the bank seats with the workers' feet on top of them. Um, and that's how they get. Uh, we, we had a graphic uh, that uh, somebody from uh, the Worker Center New Labor put together from a, from a worker uh, where they fit 17 people into a minivan. And the, you know, the organizer didn't understand how this was possible, so the worker actually drew it out. And we have a diagram on the ProPublica website where, uh, fortunately, it's the only time, if you Google how to, how to fit 17 people in a minivan, it's the only thing that will come up. Um, so a little bit of data. Um, temp work, traditionally, we think of as office jobs, uh, the Kelly girl stereotype. Uh, but uh, for the most part, the growth in this industry has come in blue-collar jobs. You see where white-collar jobs once made up 60%, they now make up uh, 40%. These are, the, these are some towns that have the highest percentage of temp work in the country. Uh, the gentleman here was talking about the BMW plant. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina has one of the highest, one in 11 workers, uh, work, one, one in 11, one in 12 workers works as a temp. Uh, when I talked to people there, most of them pointed to the, uh, the BMW plant as one of the major sources of that. Uh, you see outside of Chicago and uh, some of the major areas in New Jersey, some warehouses areas like Memphis, Tennessee, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Kent County, which is uh, home to office furniture manufacturers. These are the major occupations of temp workers. You see, you know, production helpers, you know, they, they've taken over about 30% of that. Uh, a lot of these things are essentially laborers, production laborers, factory laborers, warehouse laborers. Uh, assemblers, you know, people who work at auto plants and other sort of late assembly, uh, and then the traditional data entry keyers and uh, construction laborers. This is Day Davis. Day Davis would have turned 23 on Saturday. Uh, so Day grew up in Florida. He was born Lawrence Daquan Davis, but everyone knew him, call him Day. His mother, Tanya, Washington was 14 when she gave birth to him in North Carolina. Um, she struggled to make ends meet working at daycares and dollar stores, fast food chains and supermarkets. But uh, Day was lucky to have a support network uh, and his family worked hard to raise him right. Day essentially did what we expect anyone who comes from a low income disadvantaged uh, background to do. He graduated from a military academy. Uh, he enrolled in Job Corps, which is the federal job training program for low income youth and he studied to be a medical assistant. Um, he got his diploma and he started applying for jobs, hoping to work at a pharmacy, work at Walmart, work you know, anywhere where he could put this uh, degree to use. And uh, uh, eventually met a girl that he was going to marry. Uh, and one day she was eight months pregnant and she woke up and felt that something wasn't right and there was blood in her placenta had ruptured. The doctors ran some tests and found the baby had no heartbeat. So this is a, a picture of a brief moment where they're holding uh, the baby. Uh, so after this, Day decided that he uh, you know, became even more determined to get a job and applied pretty much anywhere he could. And as um, opportunities were running out, he found himself going the way that many people in Jacksonville's north side do, which is to the temp agencies. Everyone kind of knows there are certain temp agencies that you need to go to to get any of the good blue collar work in the area. So he went to a place called Remedy Intelligence Staffing, which uh, you probably have never heard of, but it is part of the select staffing uh, chain. This is the one I talked about originally with, uh, with the Reiteros, uh, except it is a franchise of the temp agency. So it's not actually run by the corporate. Um, one morning he got a call in the morning saying that you know there was work at the Picardi bottling plant that afternoon and that he should be there at 2.45 for a 15 minute orientation before his 3 p.m. shift. Uh, Day was you know ecstatic about finally uh, getting a job opportunity um, and he was, uh, I interviewed his brother and his brother said, you know, everyone's family said he was ecstatic. You know, he was, he was talking about how he'd finally be able to pay his mother back for a fender bender that he had. He'd be able to buy some new shoes and if things went well, uh, maybe he would start his life with his fiance. 
uh, who was living in Atlanta at the time. He called his mother to tell her the good news. His mother's in school studying pharmacology and asked if she could pick him up to buy the steel-toed boots, the white shirt, and the khakis that were required, the required uniform for the job. Um, and so he had this 15-minute uh, orientation for the 3 p.m. shift. After that, he briefly went into the bathroom and took a picture of himself, uh, proudly sending it to his fiance. So uh, we have there's a video, but I don't want to play the sound. And it's supposed to pop up according to the PowerPoint directions. But uh, we'll pretend it's there. I'll, I'll, I'll narrate. Um, the uh, Bacardi bottling plant had, had, been, had, had been having uh, many problems that the company knew about. The uh, day, uh, day was assigned to essentially check the bottles in the bottling line to make sure that their labels were attached cor correctly. A very kind of basic entry level temp job. And there was another part of this plant where they had uh, a big two story machine that packed the cases of the, of the rum bottles onto a pallet uh, called a palletizer. And uh, the palletizers have been acting up. The, the rum would sort of break in the case and uh, the conveyor belt would get very sticky and that would cause the boxes to sort of crash into each other and the bottles would come crashing down to the floor below. And they had had a consultant come in and do a report and the consultant said you should really have hard hats and do something about the situation and the company never did. Um, so, and and um, the person who ran the palletizers had this... Uh, very busy do job of sort of running around the, the, uh, the palletizer and going over the catwalks. I went over the conveyor belt, trying to keep everything in line uh, and said that, and, and one employee who was interviewed by OSHA uh, after the accident I'm going to talk about said he was working three shrink wrappers and five palletizers at the same time uh, when he had a near miss and his right leg almost got caught by a mechanical rake that pushed the, the, uh, the boxes into a pallet. These are some of the, the findings of uh, Bacardi. So, so let me back up and tell you what happened first. So, uh, day, so this machine was acting up. Day, uh, the palletizer operator called on his radio, is there any temps available who could help out cleaning the glass up from underneath the machine? Day uh, was very eager, you know, was called over. He was available, he was called over to help. Um, and he was assigned to go clean up glass from underneath the palletizer. Uh, while this was happening, the, t the palletizer operator and one of the supervisors were wiping down the conveyor belt upstairs. They were getting calls on the radio saying, you know, what's going on? Get this line running, get this line running. Uh, so they were very quickly going through it. The company had taught them, rather than following the proper lockout tagout procedures, does so everyone know what lockout tagout is? No. Enough people, okay. So lockout tagout is uh, a basic factory safety rule that says when you uh, are shutting down a machine, you don't just press the off button. You actually need to go and make sure that all the power source is you know, disconnected from the wall. You need to brace things. Uh, in this case, you need to brace the palletizer so that if you do start up the machine, it doesn't come crashing down uh, and that it will have like, kind of a bar to stop it. Um, the, 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 this was not covered in the 15-minute training session that he had. Um, and the palletizer operators actually didn't, none of them actually knew this lockout tagout procedure. The person, the inspector, who was supposed to make sure everybody <laughs> knew this lockout tagout procedure didn't know how to do it himself. Um, and so the, the, everyone had essentially been trained to cut corners, to essentially just push the e-stop, the, the emergency stop on the machine and go about their business and then go back and start the machine. So Day Davis was underneath the machine cleaning up glass with a broom when these guys had finished up their work up top uh, they were eager, you know, er, they were um, pressure, felt pressure to get the machine up and running again. So they came out and pressed the machine. The cases of rum come down the line. They get pushed into a pallet and the pallet goes down. Uh, and at this point, the workers here scream and then nothing more. And they realize that day was underneath the machine. Uh, and they can't get the, you know, they tried as much as they could. They couldn't get... Uh, the thing to go back up to pry it off of him and he was crushed to death. Um, 90 minutes into his first shift, he didn't even make it to his first break when he had promised to call his girlfriend and his mom and tell him how the job was. 
these are some of the things that OSHA found in the report, uh, things that you never want to see in an OSHA report. The employer is production, product, and profit oriented. They do not want to slow down production and spend funds on temporary employees who may not be in their facility day to day. Not training these employees saves the company valuable training time. This would equate to Bacardi showing ownership of the employee and establishing more risk for their company, which they're trying to limit. Number two, the company appears to have, this is after OSHA came in for an interview. The company appears to have attempted to shift blame to its temporary agencies. They have taken the position that the employee does not belong to them. Therefore, they are not responsible for their safety. Uh, this is Leslie Toke as the safety director. She made a comment. She stated that Picardi had managed to stay out of the media for a long time until just now, but it was only for one day. Plain indifference. This is not the first comment of this type she has made concerning protecting product and the Bacardi name. Uh, in the story we did uh, on safety and temp work, uh, these, there, there were several kind of examples of this. This wasn't the only uh, time that this came up in an OSHA report. Uh, there was a guy named Travis Kidd who was run over by a trash compactor. Uh, and his, and OSHA came out and interviewed, and landfill management told them that they weren't required to provide him with the same uh, personal protective equipment as the regular employees because he was a temp employee and not their employees. Um, uh, another recycling plant was kind of, the manager was kind of surprised when OSHA came and asked him about it because he said, we don't train temps. That's not our job. Uh, and then this was a, a somewhat interesting situation. This was a, uh, a textile recycling plant that, uh, where the stuff went it to make um, the floor mats in, uh, in cars. Uh, and this company had uh, a, 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 another type of staffing model called a professional employer organization, a PEO. And uh, this facility operated, uh, this first time I've ever seen this, employer in absentia. Uh, which is sense for the lack of responsibility. So SOEX had essentially said that strategic outsourcing was the employer, and strategic outsourcing says they are not responsible for the safety of these employees because they're not their employer either. Uh, and so no one was in charge. Um, very briefly, uh, we did do some analysis of temp worker injury rates using workers' comp data. There's no sort of perfect way using the Bureau of Labor Statistics data to uh, come up with an injury rate and see if temps are actually being harmed more than regular workers. But using workers' comp data, we saw in California and Florida, temps had a 50% greater risk of being injured on the job than non-temps, uh, uh, kind of about that range in the other states that we could get our hands on data. Uh, in Florida, temps were twice as likely as regular employees to suffer crushing injuries, dislocations, lacerations, fractures, and punctures. In every state, it was kind of uniform that, you know, every state we got data on, temps were three times as likely to suffer an amputation on the job. Uh, and then this was, part of this was because temps are more likely to, fi to, to find jobs in dangerous occupations. Uh, like I showed you at, at the beginning, uh, temps uh, kind of overrepresent in the labor, you know, as laborers. Um, but when we looked at just blue collar workplaces, the situation actually got worse. We thought that this was, you know, so just simply explained by the occupation they were assigned to. And it actually turned out that when you compared temps and blue collar workplaces to regular employees, they were about six times as likely to be injured as permanent employees in the same jobs. Uh, other things caught in, struck by heat exhaustion, chemicals. Uh, then the last slide, uh, this is OECD data, which tracks, uh, believe it or not, someone actually tracks temp regulations around the world. Uh, and there's a data set you can get from OECD that shows you um, what kind of regulations they have. Something, th some things like prohibiting temps from working in hazardous occupations, uh, things like uh, l putting a limit on how long someone can actually be a temp worker, or requiring that temps uh, get the same benefits and pay as regular workers and can't just be replaced as a way to cut costs. Uh, and if you look all the way at the bottom here, you know, we start at c with Korea and Poland and Slovenia, and all the way at the bottom is the U.S. Uh, with a couple countries below it. And that concludes. So that's really sobering and hard to follow up on. But I, we do have some time for discussion. And um, if 
feel like part of my job as a moderator of a discussion is to be provocative, so I'm going to try to do that, and hopefully you all can help me with that so we can give our panelists their money's worth for being here. Um, so the question I want to ask is, I think Annette did a good job of sort of stating, I want to make sure you're hearing this, Annette. Spot. <laughs> so uh, Annette did a good, a good job of sort of explaining or making the point that there is, we can't look at all these structures in the same way and they may include companies as large as the Sodexo, or, uh, an industry I know a lot about, security, spent a lot of time doing security organizing. G4S is the second largest employer in the world, I believe, after Walmart, a major multinational security company based in Great Britain. Um, so my question is, does a company or does something like permanent outsourcing with companies as large as G4S belong <coughs> even in the same category or should this be even in the same conversation as the type of work that Michael just described or Susan, you were describing in terms of temporary staffing and the type of fly-by-night operators with really no um, interest in taking responsibility for the workforce? Is this even the same type of thing that we're talking about or should we be separating these and discussing these and grappling with them separately? So I, we can be free-flowing here, so whoever wants to take it, speak to it. Okay. Well, let me just take a first cut. I, I, obviously, it depends, but I, uh, I would argue in general, yes, in particular with the Sodexo and other examples that you cited, um, it's uh, very common for companies, hospitals, public schools, and the like to um, you know, decide that they need to cut costs and outsource, uh, for example, food services to a company like Sodexo. Now, sometimes they're outsourcing uh, 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 food services or the like to a company because they just do a better job than they do. And so in that sense, it's, it's not bad and it's, it's not a great concern. But oftentimes, it is also uh, a motivation would be to uh, lower wages or to reduce benefits levels. Uh, public schools and other government offices are a good example where they have, may have generous, generous retirement benefits. And there's a requirement to cover all employees. And that's a, a good way to, uh, to reduce those. So it, it's subtle, it all depends, but not necessarily. I don't think there's a simple rule that you can use to say, no, we shouldn't consider these larger companies. Um, one point I want to make also is that some of these abuses uh, are made by some of the largest staffing companies in America. Well, it's not necessarily everyone. Uh, Select Staffing is the fourth largest industrial staffing company in America. It, it sends out in a given week, it sends out as many employees at Starbucks. Um, and if you look at the list by Hoover's <coughs> or some of the other ones that have rated uh, biggest employers, uh, Kelly Services, Manpower, Express will often come up on top as well as being some of the largest employers in the country. Um, I think I would, God, is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think it's an excellent question, and I feel like, to me, the reason to, from an organizing and policies perspective, the reason to care about contracting out um, at the end of the day is um, because you think, one, you, you're worried about the impacts it has, but two, you think it gives you leverage that it potentially gives you leverage. Um, and that is the work of a lot of uh, the strategies that NELP laid out is, you know, if there's an employer upstream who is effectively um, dictating that workers will be paid in violation of wage and hour laws because they're not sending, you know, they're, they're squeezing their subcontractors so much, then that's a great hook, right? And we want to strengthen the ability to hold that employer upstream accountable. I totally get that. But in my mind, once you start talking about G4S and Sodexo and, and company, there's a point where I don't think it's useful anymore to say, yes, that's a contractor, because that company is so powerful in and of itself. One, I don't think you're gonna get leverage on it by targeting its clients. And two, we should just be going after it as a bad company that pays crappy wages, not because it's a contractor, but it is dictating, much like Walmart does 
It is dictating wages and prices in its markets, right? In the end, this is sort of, this is where I've sort of ended up, and then I'll shut up, but in the end, I feel like we're, we're fetishizing this difference between companies that sell to customers versus companies that sell to other companies. But in the end, they're all the same thing, and when they become behemoths, it doesn't matter if their customer base is businesses or individual consumers. We need to be going after them in the same way um, and trying to get accountability or trying to do organizing in the same way. So I actually think there is a difference, and to me, ultimately, it's a, it's a, it's a strategic difference and I do think there's a point where the contracting frame doesn't get you anything anymore but that, that's just my opinion and it may be totally and I'm not an organizer so I totally defer to all the organizers in the room okay. this is a fascinating topic and I can ask questions all day but I want to make sure people in the audience have a chance and we've got Mike runners who can get questions so I see some hands gentlemen over second row the only thing I want to add to that, uh, my name is Lee Adler from uh, ILR School at Cornell. Uh, the only thing I want to add to the comments that have been made, not to take a position on, on your provocative observation, is that it's not just companies that do this. In the late 1990s, there were two very interesting uh, appellate decisions that came out of the city of New York. And there was a terrific documentary uh, that was called A Day's Work for a Day's Pay that uh, was very, very powerful. And it dealt with the health and safety of WEP workers. And actually, the quote, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, the gentleman from ProPublica, I didn't get Michael, your name, but, but the quote you had in the second uh, set of quotes at the very top about, uh, no, 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 we don't give those people the kind of health and safety equipment that we give others uh, because they're not really our employee. That was actually the position of Mayor Giuliani and the head of Parks and Commissions in New York City, and it showed up in two powerful complaints that were filed by community organizations on behalf of WEP workers. Then those cases were ultimately decided against those workers because they weren't employees. They had no right to the protection of state laws. So governments do that as well. Uh, just on that point about whether the, the conversation, if those two points are relevant within the same conversation, I, th I think that they are because <laughs> of the um, seemingly unending levels of subcontracting that go on at various work sites. Most, most often in, in construction, but um, you could have a company like Sodexo that's contracting out, but ultimately their subs, they have subs to subs to subs to subs, and they may be then employing, you know, Rego with as the you know with the Reitero system. Um, in Massachusetts, we had a um, uh, a large, very well known uh, hotel renovation project in downtown Boston. Um, where there were rampant wage and hour violations as well as other violations. Um, and we had to unpeel the onion of uh, work um, employers on that site. And ultimately, now we're talking about, you know, as David said, a hotel that everyone would know the name of. Um, the general contractor on that job was a very well-known big general contractor in the New England area. But ultimately, in, in pieces of that work, we, we got down to the level of um, that the, the general had subbed out furniture moving to a company in California whose workforce came from a purported church for recovering addicts and ex-offenders in Pennsylvania. I mean, it's just mind-boggling the way that um, the subcontracting is... Uh, is shaping up out there. So I do think that it is relevant. I think the um, certainly the business model of contracting out can very much um, get down to the level of just horrendous abuses of of um, workers on a day-to-day -day level. And just the follow-up point I make to that, thank you, is that you know even in the large employer context where you've got a large employer that focuses on subcontracting, their competition, and I think Lilia made this clear in her presentation in their panel, their competition is often the many thousands of smaller companies that are the fly-by-nights, and they feel, they feel, even though they're a big company that may be Fortune 500, the downward pressure of having to compete with those smaller totally. firms. Totally. So All I right. know, oh, yes. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm uh, Mark, Mark Barenberg from Columbia Law School. I want to uh, <coughs> agree with Annetta's last point, and maybe this sort of gilds the lily. It also anticipates the, the talk I'm going to give tomorrow. But um, I want to say that, look, the economy has always been a network of contracts, right? Businesses buy and sell from each other. Uh, so it's not clear to me that the concept of contracting or contracting out really gets you anywhere at all, right? Every company or most companies these days uh, have computers, so they contract uh, with Microsoft or Apple and get hardware and software that Microsoft and Apple or their subcontractors manufactured and that their software engineers designed. Uh, most businesses uh, have a building and they rent it from a landlord, so that's a contract. Uh, the, or they buy it from a developer or the previous owner, that's a contract and the building was, was constructed by somebody else. It wasn't built in-house. Uh, and uh, you know, you could go on and on, right? So, yeah, uh, businesses contract out for, for their lawyers or their accountants. So the, the economy is just a network of buying and selling. The real question, I want to say, is where are the abuses to workers? And then, as Annetta said, let's find the pressure points uh, to change that. And uh, often, yes, the pressure point you'll find by working up some chain of contracts to some more powerful entity, in my view, the entity normally that has the greatest capitalization or cash flow. Uh, but it's not, the, the key concept is not contracting or contracting out, it's abuses and the capacity of some uh, node in the economy, some locus of concentrated capital to, to change those abuses if the proper pressure is put on that node by worker organizing, by legal uh, uh, mandates. Uh, so you don't have to come to the last segment tomorrow because I just gave my talk. <laughs> Uh, but it converges so much with, with uh, what Annette has said, and it, and it springs from Annette's point that the more you look at this, it just gets more complex because you're just looking at different mm -hmm. networks of contracts, mm -hmm. of buying and selling. Mm -hmm. If I could respond in one way to that, yes, at one level, of course. If you look at the input-output tables for the U.S. economy, there's always been lots of contracting out and so forth. I think when you think about the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics was approaching contracting out, it was really taking, trying to isolate a very specific instance, which is where workers are working on the premises of other businesses. And it gets, speaks, you know, very, uh, in a legal sense of who's responsible for occupational safety and health, who, to, to what degree uh, is the business simply um, uh, sidestepping, perhaps, uh, regulations, IRS, and, and ERISA regulations concerning provision of benefits, uh, and that sort of thing. So there I think it, it very, you can really hone down and, and kind of think about some sticky issues uh, where you would be particularly concerned about those instances. And of course, temporary help, work, that's what it is. It is assigning workers to a client's work site. If you go into a supermarket, if you go into a hospital, if you go into lots of organizations, you will see many, a large share of the workers do not work for the hospital, for the manufacturer, et cetera. And so there, I think it's a little more complicated. No, I agree. We can identify patterns, right, where there's likelier to be abuse and likelier to be some party that's responsible for the abuse on whom we can put pressure, and that's exactly So I want to make sure we give a chance to folks in the back. I saw Anna's hand up and then a woman a couple of rows ahead. Way in the back. 
We can put a little boxing ring up front here and we can all get in and do good out. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Anna Wadia with the Ford Foundation. And, um, I, you know, you hear this figure quoted a lot that something, something like 30 percent people say 30% of the American workforce are contingent workers. And I know that, Anetta, you said not all contracted out workers are contingent, not all contingent workers are contracted out, so they're kind of overlapping circles. But I wonder if you could say a little bit about how much they overlap and you know, if that 30% is true, like what percent of that percent are we talking about with these different types of arrangements that you've uh, been telling us about. Okay, um, <clears throat> and, and you should jump in, Susan, because you know this. I know, oh my God. Um, well, so I, I am skeptical of the 30% number. Um, and, uh, I think it conflates a lot of different things, some of which are contingent and some of which aren't. And I don't have actually a magic number of the percent of workers in the U.S. that are contingent. Um, uh, and I think it's a function of there's very little agreement about what contingent is. And so people will claim everybody who doesn't have a full-time permanent job for the last 30 years and claim that as contingent and others will say no it's about employment instability and volatility and you know will you have your job next month um, so I to me it's partly about people define contingent in the way um, that they are looking for given their given campaigns and the measures that are important to them I think if you look at objective, more quote objective measures of the percent of workers who are not in what we can, would consider traditional stable jobs, um, you get smaller numbers. Um, I, the reason you're hearing this discomfort, are you still there? <laughs> the reason you're hearing this discomfort is I guess I feel like, <coughs> I think there's a spectrum um, of different work arrangements in the U.S. economy. And uh, we have seen degradation of wages, of working conditions, loss of pensions, loss of health care in all of those work arrangements. That degradation has been faster in some uh, than in others. Um, but it seems important to me that we, um, we keep our eye on that piece, that the decline of the social contract, deunionization, whatever you want to call it, has happened in a lot of different work arrangements. And it has happened in industries where everybody's still a full-time, full-year worker, um, but they're making crappy wages. Um, and so sometimes I get uncomfortable with um, the desire to parcel out one t set of jobs or put a label on a set of jobs that are hyper-exploited or um, that are especially contingent. In some ways, everybody is contingent at this point in the U.S. because we're employment at will. Um, wage growth has been stagnant, and anybody can lose their job tomorrow. I'm not saying throw it all out. I'm not saying don't pay attention to specific categories of workers, especially workers, and jobs that have been especially vulnerable. But um, my excursion into this debate about how to count contingent workers has sort of left me backing off a little bit on um, the enterprise of trying to quantify that number. In a sense, if I may Sorry, that was really offer, you're, you, you're saying, and it this speaks to your point as well, it, it matters less the structures matters more the working conditions that result from them and the locus of power one must identify in order to try to change yeah. them. Yeah. So uh, a couple rows in front in the blue sweater. Hi, thanks. My name is Patricia Gerardo. I'm with Open Society Foundations. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Um, and I have not read the report yet, even though I'm looking forward to cuddling up with it later. <laughs> um, I was curious, what I got from all of your presentations was the argument for how this is an abusive system that controls workers and um, you know really uh, puts workers in a more vulnerable position and you can have a system where you can easily replace them. What I didn't get from your presentations was 
um, whether or not this is actually um, uh, a cost-effective or money-making uh, process for especially the larger companies. You know, with the slide that Aneta showed, it's definitely not an efficient system. Um, and I see where the contracting um, uh, companies can make money, uh, but are, you know, are they saving costs, the, you know, the larger company in contract fees than they would in raising workers' salaries a little bit? And if you even, you know, put into, you know, the cost of, you know, everything from lawsuits to recalls to, you know, everything else. Is this actually an argument that has any basis? Or is it more of an example where we heard of tobacco companies that were paying more in legal fees than actually paying out in what the fines would be just because they're so determined to have that control in the industry? So I was just curious whether or not this is actually a cost-effective measure. In a sense, asking if there's a high road argument against these sort of structures. Anyone want to take that? I can. Go ahead, Michael. I can try to talk about it from the temp agency's perspective. Um, I don't think this is a, a profit. I don't think that the, the margins for temp agencies aren't that great uh, because um, of how low they have to go to compete. Uh, at the higher end, though, um, at, for the client company, they get the benefit of not having to pay the same benefits. They don't uh, talk about the, I guess, more optional benefits like health insurance. If you have it in your firm and you subcontract out janitors, you don't have, you know, the subcontracting firm doesn't have to follow your benefit plan. Um, pension plan, 401ks, all those things. Uh, then the sort of mandatory benefits, they don't, the, if a worker gets injured, the worker's compensation, uh, the, the, the settlement and it's not, no, not only is a settlement not paid for by the client company, but also the premium increase is not on the temp, not on the client company's experience rating. It's on the temp agencies, so they don't see those costs. Um, then there's this other benefit of if you actually employ people, you have the problem of people calling in sick, people's car breaking down, and then uh, with the temp agency, that's not a problem because they could easily find somebody else. Uh, and when you get down to the structure of uh, Rigo and the Raiteros, it's even more cost effective because now, uh, you know, the temp agency, if they send somebody to you for four hours who you don't have any work for because the line's too busy, you've got to uh, pay them, usually in a lot of states, uh, for that time or pay, pay the temp agency. Uh, with, with Rigo, if someone's car breaks down, you know, he can easily call up somebody and get them down to that neighborhood. Who, who's dying for that job. And um, what was my other point on this? Uh, yeah, and essentially, the, the, all those things are, they're able to save money on. But I don't know about the efficiencies, if anyone else wants to take that. Oh, I, just really quickly, because other people have questions. I do think, um, you know, there certainly are examples where companies make mistakes. But I do think that, uh, you know, to the extent that you've seen a trend increase in, in use of temporary help, which we certainly have, we can see it in the data. And I also believe, although it's not well measured, there has been increase in contracting out. Um, uh, that trend increase is because companies find it profitable to do. I do think um, also that we're seeing a period where there's tremendous pressure on, uh, downward pressure on compensation overall for workers, uh, given the current employment situation. And this is just a, one mechanism <laughs> by which companies lower wages and, and benefits. Um, there, there, there. Did I miss? Hi, um, I, I want to thank Michael especially for bringing some stories to the panel. Um, my name is Stephanie Garakani and I work with Workers Defense Project and we organize construction workers in Texas. Um, I just wanted to offer um, some other thoughts to the size matters debate in terms of um, how contracting works and the Sodexos of the world versus the fly-by-night contractors and the way that we see that dynamic playing down, uh, playing out on, on the ground level, um, at least in Texas. I think, of course, when we're talking about challenges to organizing um, questions of accountability around health and safety and training, et cetera, I think there's um, a lot of shared experiences between people who are working um, for really small employers in a very extenuated contracting chain and people who might be working for um, uh, larger shops. Um, 
at a work site in which um, they might not be at the work site of a, of a direct employer, um, but in a very practical sense, um, in terms of the size matters debate, uh, what we see among our memberships is just the, um, the actual direct employers of a lot of our members are so small that we're not even able to take advantage of the protections afforded by federal laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act simply because we can't prove um, employer coverage. And so that's, um, I think that's a very practical um, challenge to, to dealing with smaller employers that are at the bottom end of a, a very large, long contracting chain. I know that gentleman had a hand up for a while, so I'm going to go there and then I'll come back. Hi, thanks. Um, Eric Dernbach, I work with the Laborers International Union. We're particularly interested in um, temp workers in construction. And anyone can answer this question. I'm struck by this issue of unpaid waiting time. It seems like it's so typical for workers to show up at 4 a.m. You have to wait for a while. Then you get driven somewhere. You might have to wait some more. And then at the end of the day, you got to go back and like maybe wait for your paycheck. Should this waiting time be paid? And if it should be, um, is the whole industry kind of structured on uh, getting this kind of unpaid uh, waiting time subsidy? And if we can get that waiting time paid, does it kind of ruin the economics of the industry? Kind of very interesting. It kind of seems like an Achilles heel for this industry if we can get that paid. Yes. <laughs> I think we've talked about this. The answer is yes. All right. <laughs> yeah, whenever I've had a question about this, I've asked Chris for the answer. <laughs> yeah, it's an hands here, I think. <laughs> Hi, my name is Darlene Lombos. I'm with Community Labor United in Boston. And a few things, not just this panel, but a few other panels have stuck out with me. One is um, my brother Mike Munoz, who says the goal should really be about building worker power, which I absolutely agree. There's some other things that came up in this panel that we have funds are, are put, um, are put put people to into temp work, which is really concerning to me. And then that um, I think Annette said something about contracting out or is one of the most unstudied dimensions of economic restructuring right now. And I, all those things are in my head connected and partly because what we've been trying to do is look at this whole contracting outsourcing issue and see where are the points of leverage and where we can build worker power. But we think that there has to be multi-strategies and multi-pronged uh, organizations that can deal with those. And one, of course, is we want to update labor law, sure, and there's this whole conference that at the end we'll talk about this functional employer great um, framework that NELP is developing out. Secondly, we think that this WIA funds, putting people into temp work is a problem and that the workforce development system needs to change and be updated and we need different strategies on how to get workers into actual careers and have a career pipeline. And then thirdly, one of the, reasons, one of the questions came up of why, do we, why should we care about this why is contracting so important is that it also we need to restructure our safety net that um, the employer employee relationship has been that our unemployment insurance our social security has really been predicated on that employer employee relationship if we don't know who our employers are if they're not paying into that system our sa safety net goes down and i and these are conversations we're having in massachusetts with our department of labor with leaders here today um, and i just want to ask the question um, are there data sets that exist or are studies being done about the safety net in particular and what contracting is doing to affect the safety net in particular? Takers. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? I, I was going to quickly hey, answer. Okay. There, there, there are a lot of I'm at peace with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. As far as how, how these types of models affect the safety net, I know, well, in the construction industry, which is more like Mike described, which it, we see things that are a lot worse than that, um, studies have been done in state levels that show that the losses, to, for instance, to UI taxes, uh, and UI taxes, uh, and in workers' compensation, for instance, in, in Tennessee, uh, where the, the fraud level in the construction industry uh, may be up to 22%, which is probably a low number. 22% of the workers employed off the books are intentionally misclassified. For instance, the, the hit to the workers' compensation system is a loss of about $92 million uh, a year in workers' comp premiums. 
uh, I think those numbers, $17 million a year in state UI. Uh, so that there, there are a number of studies that, that, that have quantified uh, that issue. Um, if I could just uh, address your one piece about uh, part of your question about uh, we are using a lot of temporary help and, and uh, you know, welfare to work and, and uh, whether that should be concerning and so forth. The, um, I worked with, uh, on a study for several years with the city of Detroit and in that uh, case it was uh, studying a welfare to work program. They were placing about 20% of their people uh, who got jobs into temporary help uh, uh, jobs. That was very typical uh, based on evidence around the country. Um, you know, uh, participation in WIA is found to um, increase your probability of working for a temp agency by 50 percent. So um, it, it's, it's very common. One um, a recommendation that we had um, that actually I think Detroit independently uh, did was to uh, evaluate their uh, service providers by the uh, length and the duration <coughs> by which they were uh, judged uh, to be successful uh, in terms of their placement. Because what we were finding was initially they, were, uh, they had to check to make sure the person was still employed after three months and typically the job would end after, at three months. But um, you know, when they, they, uh, in response to that, they, they lengthened, they pro incentivized the contractors, the service providers, um, helping to place workers in into jobs, and that you know should have provided less of an incentive to place with temps. So that sort of thing, um, you know, at DOL level, you know, kind of what uh, what kind of uh, gauges, benchmarks do we use to evaluate these WIA programs and so forth can be used to to uh, put pressure at the local level to reduce the use of temp work. So we probably have time for one more question since we're over, and I know people want to get to the reception. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, Tim Bell, Chicago Workers Club. One thing that uh, we should also understand drives the temp staffing industry is immigration. Uh, the, the use, the proliferation of E-Verify has caused many of the major companies in Chicago to no longer hire people directly. They have to go, if you're an immigrant and you want a job, you have to go to a staffing company in order to get sent to that, to that facility. And, and this is one of the unintended consequences of, uh, of employer sanctions and, uh, and E-Verify. And it's also causing uh, great tension with the African American community because uh, Latinos are being, uh, in, in Chicago at least, the immigrants are being preferred for those sorts of jobs because they have something against them. They're, they're, they're afraid of, of being detected by immigration, so therefore we're not gonna complain to the Department of Labor, we're not gonna complain to OSHA. We just wanna get to work, get on the bus with Regal, and, and make a little bit of money. And this is basically shutting out another large sector of the blue, of the blue collar uh, workers from the, uh, from the workforce. So part of our strategy is to unite workers and to have uh, immigrants and African Americans uh, and others that are native born to uh, come together to fight the system. But we have to understand that immigration reform is part of this process. So we have to wrap up right now. Can we give the panel one more round of applause? So Kathy, any logistics that we should tell folks about? And thanks, and can we just, since it's the end of the day, offer our thanks and appreciation to the staff here who've helped us? Thank you.